So now it's my pleasure to introduce our second main speaker. I'm talking about Professor Jose Ignacio Murillo, also from the University of Navarra, and um, where he is currently teaching a course of uh, philosophical anthropology uh, called Phenomenology, Biology and Existence. Professor Muri Murillo is, renowned, uh, is a renowned disciple of uh, Leonardo Polo also. He is the director of the interdiscipl interdisciplinary research group Biology and Subjectivity in Philosophy and Contemporary Neu Neuroscience of the University of Navarra. He is also the assistant di director of Estudia Poliana, the Spanish journal about the philosophy of Leonardo Polo. He has more than 60 scientific articles about the body-mind problem, and his books, his books include Operation, Habit, and Reflection, the knowledge as the, anthropo and the, knowledge as the anthropological key in Aquinas, the revealing value of death, the edition of uh, gen the general psychology course of, Leon of Leonardo Polo, among others, and he will be speaking to us about uh, the body-mind problem. Thank you very much, Professor Murillo. So I thank you very much to the, the organizers of, the, of this conference for the invitation. And they, they asked me uh, precisely to, to speak about this topic, the mind-body problem in Polo. Uh, but it was difficult for me to, to choose uh, what, what to say about this, because uh, this is a, a topic I have, uh, I have studied during the last years especially, and it has a lot of, um, of perspective to, um, and a lot of, Sorry, ah, okay. and, and so what to do? My idea is here to, to make um, a only a synthesis of, of what, what is for, for me the, the the capital points of the of the philosophy of Polo that can uh, enlighten this topic. Eh? So I'll read my my text, and after this I answer the questions. What we usually call the mind-body problem is not only one of the main topics in contemporary philosophy, but is also the hallmark of a cultural debate of major consequences. What is at stake here is our vision of humanity and its place in reality. And this is not merely a theoretical issue. Our understanding of what is good and possible for human beings and the kind of society we can and want to build depends on the answer we give. As this problem appears today, it depends on a theoretical framework that it is necessary to comment on, in my opinion, Western philosophy has poorly explained the role of the body. However, the fact that mind and body are considered as things that are different enough to be understood separately, but are too difficult to conceive of together, is the consequence of certain theoretical and methodological paths that the mainstream of thought within philosophy have undertaken in the last centuries. So it is necessary to unveil them if we wish to solve or at least clarify the problem. For analytical philosophy of mind, the mind-body problem can be traced to Descartes and the sharp distinction between the res cogitans and the body. Descartes' ideas on this topic 
must be remembered because they still reflect the theoretical framework used by many scientists and a considerable number of philosophers. According to Descartes, the body has to be studied with an objective and external methodology that could make it mathematically tractable. On the other hand, the mind is the point of view of the subject that experiences reality and intervenes in it. So subjectivity is the territory of human experiences as such, something that can be subjected to some extent to a logical rule, but cannot be directly perceived from the outside. It is a fact that human subjectivity is also linked to a body. But for the car, there is no adequate unified intellectual methodology by means of which both realms of human experience can be understood together. The interaction between body and mind appears only as a mere fact, and the way it occurs as obscure and unintelligible. It is true that Descartes also attempts a metaphysical approach. Both the objective body and the subjective soul have in common that they are substances created by an infinite and omnipotent God. But this is not sufficient to make the way they are put together intelligible. Thus, the grand rift is open. Other philosophers, such as Kant, will accept this impossibility almost as a philosophical method, while others, such as Spinoza, will dare to make the leap of entering the very mind of God. The Cartesian approach, however, will continue to be a point of departure and a constant reference for the thinkers who came after. In my opinion, the importance of the Cartesian approach is due to the fact that Descartes wanted to establish a firm grounding for that new way of investigating reality that has resulted in modern science. In short, modern science's success consists in having discovered useful ways of objectifying, reducing and modeling phenomena in such a way that we can aspire to discover the laws that undergird them. But the clarity of this enterprise and the utility of its outcomes can obscure its limitations. In fact, especially among natural scientists, but also among philosophers, there is a trend towards taking as the orthodox view the assertion that we can only accept the existence of a mind to the measure it is scientifically tractable, and that among the various scientific approaches, the fundamental one is neuroscience. At the end, everything needs to be reduced to a fundamentally naturalistic explanation. Even a shallow knowledge of the history of philosophy provides one with many objections and, inconsisten and inconsistencies that affect this position. The question is then why the orthodox position is so resilient and why many intelligent people, sometimes against their profoundest convictions, find themselves with nothing to oppose it intellectually. I think the reason must be sought more from a cultural point of view than from a philosophical one. The problem is not a new philosophy that seeks to prove its, its thesis, but rather the lack of philosophical formation among scientists and even some so-called philosophers. Some time ago, positivism and naturalism were philosophical opinions, but now they are the default view among scientists along with an impoverished kind of pragmatism. The intellectual debate has, by, by and large, simply abandoned the big questions and left them to the subjective realm, concentrating on scientific topics instead. God, soul, creation, morality, these are relevant only to the extent they are tractable by what we call, here and now, science. Any attempt to think outside this scientific methodology, experiments, standardized ob observations, statistics, etc., should be considered something esoteric or else mere literary fiction. This lack of an ambitious approach to the problem in contemporary philosophy makes Polo's proposal all the more interesting. A complete understanding of this proposal will require an introduction to his work his whole philosophy. 
In order to address the mind-body debate in properly Paulian terms, we would have to look not only to his anthropology, but also to his metaphysics, his theory of knowledge, and his ethics. That is, to his entire philosophy. As is well known, Polo's main philosophical contribution is the method he proposes, the abandonment of the mental limit. But Polo's method is not univocal. In fact, his main advantage is his capacity to uncover and to deal adequately with transcendental plurality, that is, with the most radical distinctions. However, the mind-body problem is, in different ways, connected with all the dimensions of this method. In my opinion, there is not a, sim a single method that exhausts the knowledge about the body. In fact, Polo has addressed several aspects of what, he, of what we have of what we have called the body-mind problem in different parts of his work. And he returned to some of those approaches in the third part of the second volume of his Transcendental Anthropology. I recall when he was writing this book and that during the time he used to repeat, it is necessary to speak more about the body. Uh, Juan Fer, uh, remembers, yeah, I'm sure this. My purpose here, however, is to offer an introduction to Polo's view on this topic. My paper is centered on some of his main theses about the human body and its relation to the person to whom it belongs. The first remark pertains to the understanding of what the body is in reality. The very notion of body is dangerous, presupposing that the body is something well-defined that lies in front of us. The German philologist Bruno Schnell remarks that in Homeric Greek, the term soma, soma, refers properly to the corpse and not to the living body. The body is mostly referred to via its members and organs, thus pointing to its functions in a way that seems not to recognize the body itself as something having a complete unity. In my opinion, this is coherent with one of Polo's theses. He doesn't understand the body as something, but rather as life. And life is not a thing that is possessed by, possessed by us, but the way through which possession is possible. Living is activity, I quote Polo, praxis and habit. We do not possess life, but we possess, possess by living. From this point of view, it appears clearly that the body must be seen more as a coordination of movements and activities than as a concrete and defined thing. This is a change of perspective which entails a lot of consequences. One of them is that the term body is only a first phenomenological characterization whose, whose real meaning remains to be clarified. But is it possible to distinguish between the body and the spiritual dimensions of the person? Interestingly, Polo too does not describe the spirit as something already complete, but describes it from the point of view of activity. As we have seen, what we call, call the body is life, but this does not exhaust human vitality. For non-personal living beings, for non-personal living beings, to live is to be. But for us, personal living beings, the life that comes through generation is received by the life which is added by the new person. And the person depends immediately on God. <coughs> Together, both the received life and the added life configure the essence or manifestation of the human person. It would be a serious mistake to understand this as meaning that the soul, that is, what would correspond to the other life, existed prior to the body, or else receive life, being somehow, somehow in a state of expectation for it. The human person exists by receiving the body he or she is. The soul, soul is nothing but the life that is added to this received life. From the point of view of added life, the received life is an inspiration that is continued by spiritual activity. From the point of view of received life, the added life is what frees itself uh, life, to some extent 
from physical causality and thus makes received life apt for an unlimited growth. This reception distinguishes the personal body from the bodies of other living beings. In this latter case, the living being is a concausality that belongs entirely to the universe. In the case of human beings, however, the body orients itself to presence. As received by the soul, the body is an attempt to defeat the delay of physical time. What does this attempt consist in? To answer this question, we have to look to the body, to its way of being. This is, by the way, a key point for all anthropology. Attention to the flesh and its concrete way of existing is the touchstone of our realistic anthropology. Another possibility is to try to explain man by focusing on the objectivities and mental constructions we use in practical life, or else on the poetic expression of our subjective experiences, thereby creating a structure where the real body is a stranger. Nevertheless, this enterprise encounters a serious difficulty. Our body does not appear completely in front of us. We have, to some extent, a direct experience of our bodies, as phenomenology has pointed out, with this notion of leaf body. But this is partial, and even to have a single and unified view of the external aspect of our body, we need mediations, such as a mirror, in the case of sight, or a systematic exploration in the case of touching. In the majority of our sensory experience, the body is a condition, but not the theme. In the case of intellectual presence, the mind requires the body, but leaves it unthought. This is for Polo a unique sense of facticity that is irreducible to other facticities. What we know about our body depends mainly on the same methods that we use to understand all living bodies. This is the reason why it is easy to confuse ourselves with other material living beings. However, if we carefully inspect the human body, we find, we find many characteristic features that are clearly visible. First of all, it is important to realize that we can approach the body from different perspectives from the point of view of the connection between anatomy and behavior, Polo has emphasized Aristotelian views about the human being as being the animal with hands. In addition, he stresses, among other topics, the relationship between hands and brain, and the importance of having a face and the possibility of speaking. But he has also, has also investigated the body, so to speak, in a more scientifically fundamental way. From this perspective, the body has a unity that is not to be confused either with the unity of the ideas nor with that of concepts. As I have pointed out before, the body does not have an objective unity the way ideas do, nor is it one in many as the concept is. The body has to be plural in order to be dynamic. This entails a process of differentiation whose unity consists in an organization by parts, or in a one that organizes its part. The body is one in parts that are different from each other, and its organization is not static. It is a process oriented to the presence. Polo characterizes the reality of the body as synchrony. Synchrony is not presence but it is the way by which life defeats the delay introduced by the material cause. We shouldn't forget that synchrony is a dynamic process. As realized in the physical world, synchrony is not a spiritual activity that can avoid temporality. Rather, it is realized in and through physical movements. It is, so to speak, a synchronization of movements. Polo offers some examples of this particular kind of unity. One of them is the unity of the genetic code. As is commonly said, the genetic code is in all the cells of the, cells of the body. But Polo remarks that at the same time, each cell is a part of the unity of the genetic code. In fact, each cell expresses only a part of the code, and this differentiation is at the same time organized at the second level. 
So the development and growing of living beings is a result of the unity of the living body, which is a unity that, at the same time, multiplies and unifies. But where synchrony appears more clearly is in the nervous system. In the nervous system, the kind of growth we have referred to is not central. For Polo, this suggests a different kind of growth and coordination. What is the function of the brain? One can say that the function of the brain is processing information and converting it into an adequate response to the challenges of the environment. But the real question is how it can do that. The brain is not a machine that is ready for that purpose. Instead, its main advantage is its plasticity and its capacity for reconfiguration and adaptation. From Polo's descriptions, I will pick out two suggestions. The first is that the brain's unity cannot be understood as a totality. The brain is composed of neurons, and, that, and thus it is a clear case of the way the body transforms itself into a formal potency by, divi by division and incorporation into a unity. But in this case, the, recep the receptive activity of the brain does not produce new neuron neurons. Instead of Instead, it profits partially from each of them and incorporates them into functional unities. This partial activation and use of the neurons, which is compatible with the participation of the neurons in other functional unities or circuits, shows that the unity of the brain is not that of a totality, but rather is detotalizing. Polo also suggests that this model can be useful to understand other realities around us, such as social interactions. In sum, the unity of the brain is not that of a set of parts already organized, but rather that of a, fro that of a process that can produce new, res new responses and coordinate in new ways. Secondly, Polo suggests that intentionality, which is the characteristic of human knowledge at the, at the level of sensation as well, does not correspond in the brain to activation, but mainly to inhibition. Activation corresponds to efficiency, but life, and especially human life, represents an increasing of formal causality. In the brain and in human behavior, the formal cause does not mean only configuration, but also control. But control depends on the capacity to inhibit neuronal activity. A proof of this is the singularity of the human brain. It is often said that a salient and distinctive characteristic of the human brain is the development of a large prefrontal cortex, which plays a decisive role in higher brain functions. Some neuroscientists call it the executive brain. It is involved in activities such as reasoning, planning, judgment, and control of behavior. But the prefrontal cortex often intervenes by inhibition. In his book on the prefrontal cortex, Joaquin Fuster says, throughout the central nervous system, inhibition plays the role of enhancing and providing contrast to excitatory functions. That pervasive role of inhibition is evident in sensory systems, like the retina, as well as motor system, uh, as the motility of the knee. In the prefrontal cortex, inhibition is the mechanism by which, during the temporal organization of actions, in the pursuit of a goal, of goals, sensory inputs and motor or instinctual impulses that might impede or derail those actions are held in check. This is also consistent with the response of Ramon y Cajal at the question, to the question about the differences between the human brain and other animals' brains. He pointed out the large number of interneurons, which seem to be the kind of neurons involved in this kind of control. In my opinion, these observations could be better explained by following the suggestions of Polo about inhibition as the cerebral realization of cognitive intentionality. As I have said, the reception of life from the parents orients receive life to our presence, and this proximity is realized as synchrony. 
Synchrony is the means to achieve the domination of the formal course over the other courses. Although this is a complex topic for a brief presentation, I wanted to refer to Polo's approach to formal causality because, in my opinion, this is one of his major contributions to the classical approach to the mind-body problem. Most classical non-reductive and non-dualistic approaches to this issue usually follow the Aristotelian thesis of the intellectual soul as formal cause of the body. However, this assertion would be misunderstood and would become useless if we understand the soul as an ideal form, that is, as a static and separated principle. On the contrary, in the physical world, causal forms are real in and through movement, and the spiritual dimensions added by his or her condition as a person are also acts, habits, and practice. At this point, some contemporary philosophers or scientists would deem Polo's proposal to be a kind of dualism. As we have seen before, although the theoretical framing of the body-mind problem is dualist today, the position that denies real existence to the res cogitans is very common and is even frequently present as the scientific position. Because, and this is the reason, in my opinion, it does not prejudice the possibilities that empirical science might solve the problem. All is nature, and nature is to be studied by empirical science. This position with which allows a lot of variation, can be characterized as monism. Truly, once we have uncritically adopted the methods of science as being the only possible methods, monism can then appear to be mere common sense. But in reality, monism has a lot of problems. First, the conception of nature is present it, uh, the conception of nature it presents is nothing but a construction a mixture of the mental and the physical. On the contrary, however, in order to understand reality, we have to accept real distinctions. In fact, we cannot ever suppress plurality in any realm of reality. So dualism itself is, in this respect, weak. We understand the physical world according to a manifold causality. Among the senses of causality, the formal cause is the cause of physical distinctions. In metaphysics, we need to accept the real distinction between essence and existence in order to accept the real distinction and compatibility between the creature and God. In the case of anthropology, Polo affirms that duality is transcendental. That is, it does not derive from the imperfection of the human being, but from his own personal condition, from him or her being intrinsically a second creature. And according to Christian faith, God is also not alien to distinctions. On the contrary, it is precisely inside the divine intimacy where the sharpest distinctions abide. But this acceptance is not a kind of dualism. In the case of the body-mind relation, we must not accept two substances that interact in a mysterious way, but rather should recognize the reality of different levels of activities. The irredu irreducibility, <laughs> irreducibility of the person to the physical world is a consequence of his or her personal condition. And, he, and the, the destiny cannot be reduced to the order of the physical universe. But the human person coexists with the physical universe. Added life and received life are totally compatible. The suggestions of Polo about their manner of being rep or their manner of being represent, represent, in my opinion, a major contribution to the classical and contemporary reflection on the body. Thank you. This is all. Thank you very much, Professor Murillo. Uh, we also have some time for questions. And the same request, please. Uh, keep the question questions and be, please be free. Be brief and free. <laughs> uh, what's the opinion of uh, Polo about the immortality of the soul? Mm, this is an interesting topic because 
Um, you see, asserts the immortality of, of the soul, understood as the uh, uh, the non-physical aspects of the of the human existence. No? But what is the soul? This is the this is the the question. No? What is really what what we understand for the soul? Because soul, all. All the people have in mind something when, when they speak about the soul, but what is the soul from a metaphysical or, or an anthropological point of view? This is a very, I, I think it's a, it's a difficult topic, no? because we can say the uh, soul is, is the spiritual activity of the, of, of the human person, and this can uh, per, uh, subsist, can exist uh, Without matter, no? this is the no? this is the idea of Paul. But the the person without the body is not a, is not complete. This is something that Polo Polo says. No? The essence of the person is not complete without the body. But I don't know if this is a an answer to the question. We have another question. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could say something about, or if Polo has talked at all about animal cognition. I mean, without animal. I mean. Uh, you know, since Descartes was not really high on what exactly animals could do in terms of cognition. So I was just wondering if he has any comments about that, independently of talking about human beings and human cognition. Uh -huh. So you, you ask for the uh, animal cognition yeah, and compare? Eh? Non-human animals. Yeah. Human, non -human animals. Yeah. So they, animals for Polo have uh, really cognition. But this is, this is, there is a difference between, there, there is a, a, a difference between cog, human cognition and animal cognition. And this is the, properly, a reality can be known by the intelligence. And animals don't have this kind of intelligence. No? The intelligence can, that can uh, understand uh, reality as such, we can say, from, in a different, and, but, Non-human animals have cognition. And we partake uh, 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 cognition with non-human animals, because imagination is a very important uh, aspect of human, of human cognition, also for, especially for practical life and for our, no, to our uh, living in the world. And animal, non-human animals have imagination and they have a memory to some extent, and they can have emotions, etc. No? But they don't have a personal uh, characteristic or content. No? This is the, and also non-human an, uh, animal imagination is very is, is weak uh, compared to, to to human imagination. This is clear. No? The redundancy of intelligence is clear. So, but I don't know if this is the, the answer to your question. That's, that's, I mean, basically, he's following then the tradition. Yeah, he's, he's, he's following the tradition in this. And this is clear in the theory of knowledge, because uh, especially the, the, first, the first volume of the theory of knowledge, a lot of things, he says, are common to, to animals and, and human beings. interesting presentation. Um, yeah, okay. hmm, there seems to be the dualism by Descartes and other modern thinkers, and the materialistic monism, the third way traditionally is the Aristotle's, the Thomas Aquinas, the, the soul as the form, the mind, if you want. You said, uh, Polo said, it is not an static principle, but dynamic principle. What does it mean in practice? The soul. The, the, the soul. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it is a way to solve the, mm -hmm. the body and mind problem, I suppose. Yeah. No? It's a, a different perspective. Uh, because the, uh, in the physical world, uh, Polo has, a, as, as he says, uh, um, a heuristical approach to Aristotelian causality. Uh, but this approach depends on the abandonment of the mental limit. And one consequence of the abandonment of the, of the mental limit 
is that you cannot understand uh, even the formal cause as something present and static, because this is a characteristic of uh, objectivity that is introduced by mental persons. So you have to re, uh, rethink the formal cause to understand how uh, distinction are real in the physical world. And distinctions in physical world are connected to efficiency, to, to matter, and to finality. No? This is a uh, this is the, because the, the, fourth, the fourth volume of the, that I appreciate uh, a lot, no? the fourth volume of the theory of knowledge, is uh, very difficult, but it's very, very interesting, because it's, uh, in my opinion, is the, the possibility of reconciling Aristotle uh, with, uh, with modern biology eh? is there. No? Eh? Uh, but if, if, if we uh, speak about human beings, no? Human beings, uh, human soul is not only a formal cause of the universe, because uh, it depends on, on any spiritual activity. So, human soul is the, is as the formal cause of our <laughs> body. Yeah? But uh, we have to approach this from the, from the point of view of, the, of spiritual activities, and not as something, as an idea, a structure, something that organizes uh, you know, in a systematic and objective, uh, in an objective way, the matter. You know? this, is the, this is the difference. You know? The difference is compatible. This is, I think, a, a profundization, you know? something, you know? a continuation of. But in Aquinas, uh, Sometimes it's not so clear, I think. Sometimes it depends uh, too much, in my opinion, from the platonic, uh, platonic uh, view. Yeah? And this is uh, easy to understand, no? because, yeah? but Aristotle depends also from the platonic view. No? And so the, the form, Aristotle doesn't see the, the soul of an ideal form eh, eh, in the in the noetic, no, in the cosmos noetos, no, but it the, the form that is in matter, he understands it eh, to some extent as an idea, eh? and this is a problem, for example, to in, in modern biology to understand and in modern physics no? to understand a lot of processes and to understand evolution, to understand. Eh, eh, Development of the of, of living beings, etc. We have another question. <coughs> yes, um, exactly. <coughs> in the ethics, uh, well, I am Antoine uh, Suarez. I am working. I am quantum physicist and quantum philosopher. I am working also on bioethics, and I get. I'm got interested in uh, polo philosophy because there is some inspiring thinking for science. And precisely in the ethics, he uh, um, he makes a short reference on quantum mechanics, um, and I think this could be uh, interesting for developing precisely the mind-body mind-body question for, for reflecting about this. And in particular, the for me very important principle you refer to of inhibition. It is a key question for understanding this relationship. My question is, do, is someone working on this aspect of... Uh, I have of, found this yes. reference, no, no, this, this is a is, short reference. I, uh, because in the, in the group, uh, uh, Alberto Vargas has, uh, has said that uh, I am in a, in a group, in an interdisciplinary group, approaching this, the, the topic, the human action from the point of view of neuroscience and philosophy. And in our group, there are some people who, uh, who are working on this, eh? in, uh, in quantum, and yes, and, and so. And I am, I am not a physicist, but I am interested in the topic. But <laughs> <laughs> eh? Yeah, but we have, to, we have to speak. So we have another question. 
Eh, I am Manisabel Moscoso from Quito, Ecuador, from the Universidad de los Hemisferios. Eh, and I, I'll try to express my, myself in English. Um, as I understand, the essence is body and soul, since Aristotle view. Um, and uh, existence, or actus descendi, is different from the essence. Okay. I, I have I have learned and I have read that uh, uh, Thomas said that the actus descendi comes to the body through the soul. The soul. Uh, through is a, a way of, of <laughs> saying it. So I understand that Polo uh, follows this uh, this route because uh, the person or actus descendi, the person actus descendi, or person or freedom, is uh, is not the same as the soul. Okay. So I have a question: Is it necessary to to affirm? the spirituality of the soul, of human soul. Is it necessary? Mm -hmm. Is it necessary if you uh, understand that, that reason mm -hmm. is only a little bit of our intellectual life? So um, reason can be maybe uh, explained by brain and every, everything. I am not a scientist, but. Uh, and the spiritual life properly can be uh, the act of the Is it uh, possible in Polo's vision? Uh, no, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but I do. Why not? Because uh, this is the, uh, the understanding of what uh, the real distinction is uh, for Polo. Because the person cannot be understood, understood without a, a, an essence. No? And, and the, the activity of the person as person eh, cannot be disconnected from, uh, from its um, uh, is essential activity. No? We, uh, uh, a person cannot, uh, uh, um, a created person eh, cannot be created eh, without an essence because this is an absurd. So, if, um, we can lo lose the body. This is clear. No? Uh, the, the question is, is an, spiritual is an spiritual activity that can remain without the body? From Aristotle and from Plato, we have this. Uh, the, 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 the problem that Aristotle arises about the, no, the, the, the characteristics of the intellectual activity eh, that cannot be reduced to something material ha, ha, have not to be surpassed. No? This, is a, this is a problem. No? But, uh, and Polo says this, this, there is something, an activity, not the person, an activity in human beings that cannot be reduced to his material components and the composition and the activation of these components. So, some spiritual activity can remain without the body. And this is the soul, no? The soul, the soul without the body, because the soul is with the body, but the soul can be without the body. And so the, the, body, the soul after, after death is this, the, spi the, the spiritual activity that cannot, that, that doesn't depend on the on the body, and this is, in my opinion, the what Polo says. It would be the the the, the question. Uh, the, we can say we can see the human body and say that we are our bodies. This is this is clear, but the 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 distinctive trait in personal uh, in humans is that each person is created directly by God. And this is something that it not, is not physical, but it's totally compatible with the physical world. No? And this is the coexistence. No? The person coexists, human person coexists with the world, but is not reduced. But this coexistence is, has also a spiritual component. 
if not uh, ethics and society and culture and etc wouldn't be possible so this is my this is my question my answer if we don't have uh, any more questions thank you very much professor murillo thank you to you now i want to to